This is my MacBook Pro 2021, at least until the real one arrives. If you're not familiar with this already, you should check out this video here. But to catch you up, I basically took the internals from a MacBook Air 2020 with an M1 chip, dropped them into a larger 15 inch laptop, and then added all the features that I could possibly want. And a lot of those features, including more ports, actually Apple ended up adding into their newest MacBook Pro lineup. Now granted, this doesn't have a notch, but that might be a good thing for many people. This project has taken a lot of hours to get to this point, but it's still very much a work in progress, obviously. And so in this video, I'm going to be walking you through the build process and how I got to this point, part by part. And then I'm going to be giving you kind of some of the ideas that I have for improving this in the future. And the goal is for you to offer as many ideas as you have, crazy or not, in improving this and making it even cooler product. So be sure to go down in the comments, give your best ideas and like any ideas that you think are good ideas. Crazy ideas like adding MagSafe, for example, anything you could think of. So let's go ahead and step through the process of the build. We'll start with the MacBook Air itself, which you can see is down to just a few parts left, including the screen, keyboard and trackpad. This was not as difficult to tear down as I expected. The biggest issue was specifically in the number of screws and the different screws that were contained within this. But when I was tearing it down, the big concern that I had was specifically with how much I could take apart before it stopped being a MacBook and it stopped working. In this video by Linus Tech Tips, they specifically say that there are basically case intrusion screws that will prevent the MacBook from turning on if they are not screwed in. And then, so I assumed when I removed screws that the MacBook wouldn't be able to turn on. That's not the case, at least with this model MacBook. I was very surprised just how little I could get down to before the MacBook wouldn't turn on. Actually, it turned on at every single point. Interestingly enough, I was able to get it down to just the bare motherboard and the Thunderbolt 3 ports, and I was still able to turn the MacBook on, which was really, really cool. I don't know if there's any sort of practical use for it, but for me, it was very important to have something as small as possible so I could start thinking through the build. My initial goal for buying the laptop that I would place the MacBook into was to have a bucket style case with a lot of internal space. And I had the idea that latitudes, modern latitudes often come with a single back panel that covers up everything. And so I had assumed that this would be the same case, but unfortunately it wasn't. When I opened up this, I realized that I quickly would run out of internal space, and so I had to dremel out many, many places. I tried many different configurations in order to retain a lot of the internal rigidity and structure, but after a while, I realized that it was just too restrictive, and so I decided to take out a lot of it. Now, notably, the other reason why I chose this laptop is, first, it has a very, very thick screen, which allows for me allowed for me, I knew that I was gonna be able to fit my touchscreen inside it, and there would be no depth issues. And then the other solution here was that I specifically wanted to have a laptop that was already out of commission. So this laptop in particular had some internal water damage to the motherboard that thankfully did not impact the keyboard. Next, let's talk about the display, which was frankly how I started this entire project. I knew I wanted a touchscreen MacBook, but my previous solutions weren't exactly what I was looking for. Having a touchscreen in front of a MacBook isn't really a touchscreen MacBook, and so I wanted to prove to myself that it was possible to actually get a touchscreen in the same case. And so that's why this was actually a few months ago that I purchased the touchscreen and I was waiting on the rest of the parts to come. Thankfully, the display worked relatively quickly and there weren't a lot of issues with it once I used the UPDD software, but frankly, it is not the best quality. If I wanted to reconsider, then I can drop in like a 4K or a high refresh rate 1080p display instead, but I've got to think that through. Oh, and one small issue that I had with the display is that currently the display ribbon cable is very, very delicate and it runs down the front of the device between the display and the keyboard itself. Now, typically you have a bundled up cable that runs through the hinge of the device when you are routing the display cable to the laptop, but unfortunately that was not the case with this, with this cable. And so it is very delicate and very, very difficult to manipulate because it is very, very stiff. Ribbon cables are not really the most versatile. And so unfortunately that's been quite a frustration. Now, I don't know how I could possibly replace the ribbon cable with something better. And so the alternative is being, being sure to get a spare, which I need to somehow find, and then 
cutting the ribbon cable, slicing the ribbon cable into its parts, and then bundling it in shrink in order to make a cable out of it that can then route through the hinge. But this is very, very scary for me because the ribbon cable came standard with the, with the display itself, and I'm not sure that I'd be able to easily find a replacement because I'm not familiar with ribbon cables, but I'm going to do some searching, and if you guys have any ideas, you should let me know down in the comments. The display isn't actually screwed in place anywhere because the screw holes don't line up. Instead, it's just friction mounted using the frame, the front frame and bezel of the, the device. It's fine for now, but it's not very polished and finished, so I think that's one of the things that I probably can work on. Really, I could probably just use some double-sided tape on the back of the display in order to get to a more finished product. But I don't want to do that quite yet, because one of the biggest ideas that I have to start Maybe you already thought of it. It's in this logo right here. While the pearlescent white of the sticker looks like it might be light lit up, it's not, unfortunately. Underneath, if you couldn't tell in the B-roll, the Dell logo still sits underneath it and shines through. I was thinking I would remove the Dell logo, run a, run a LED strip up the back of the device, and then have a glowing Mac logo. Hopefully I could get some sort of plastic cutout of a Mac logo or 3D print something that could somehow show through light. But if you have any ideas for that, let me know. I think that would really finish off this product. Now let's talk about the keyboard, which is honestly my favorite part. Not everyone wants a full keyboard with a number pad, but the fact that I could somehow convert a old Latitude keyboard to USB in order to plug into the MacBook was my biggest and proudest moment through this entire process. In order to do it, you need a Teensy, which is a small Maker or Arduino that allows you to do a lot of cool stuff of which I'm still exploring. The Teensy needs to somehow attach to the existing ribbon cable of the keyboard itself. And in order to do so, basically what I did with the Instructables video is I silk screened my own little custom board that allowed me to connect a traditional ribbon cable connector to the Teensy itself. Now this required quite a bit of soldering, all in maybe like 60 different things needed to be soldered, and it was not the easiest process. I failed it a couple times, and ironically, this was the biggest waiting period for this whole project because I needed to wait on AliExpress parts. Once I did that, I was able to plug a micro USB cable into the side of the Teensy and then route that USB cable to my laptop, and then take the inputs that the keyboard sent and convert those into a custom program that would come out as traditional letters and numbers from the keyboard. Which sounds like a lot more difficult process than it was, but frankly, the Instructables video made it really easy. Now, frankly, the result is a very, very powerful small board that allows me to convert basically any keyboard, nearly any keyboard, into USB, which I have a bunch of cool ideas coming. So be sure to get subscribed if you're interested in seeing that. The whole thing isn't quite perfect because ironically, the UPDD software that I use for the touch response recognizes the keyboard and tries to take it as mouse input for some reason. And so it often breaks the keyboard when I turn the computer off and turn it back on. I don't know why this is happening, but at this current point, I'm not able to use the keyboard and the, the touch screen at the same time. I have to kind of pick and choose, which is very, very frustrating. You might notice that there are a few extra keys on the top of the latitude, including a power button and volume controls. Now, I would love to be able to customize these to work just like everything else, but at their current state, they are non-functional, which takes me straight to Touch ID. So what I realized when I was taking apart the MacBook is that the Touch ID sits on, ironically, the audio, like the headphone jack board, which unfortunately has a very, very small ribbon cable. It's only about a couple inches long. And the, the Touch ID sensor only has about a half inch sized ribbon cable, which severely limits the locations in the chassis that I could put it. I decided to not include it because spa internal space was getting a little bit cramped. But hypothetically, if I wanted to, I could drop in the audio and the Touch ID sensor somewhere in the, in the case. Now, when I did so initially, I could get the Touch ID sensor working, but unfortunately it uses the MacBook itself to ground itself when use it, used as a power button. And so I could only use the Touch ID sensor as a Touch ID sensor, which was frustrating. And 
because of the internal layout, I could only put it somewhere within the case. The current internal layout means that that Touch ID sensor ends up just around here in the bottom left of the keyboard rest, in the keyboard deck, which I hypothetically could Dremel out in order to make room for a Touch ID sensor. But because of the way that the motherboard is currently structured, it is a lot easier to take off the keyboard itself and have a lot of slack to be able to work on the internals. If I was to instead have the Touch ID sensor ingrained in the, in the bottom of the keyboard, then I would be unable to easily take it out because of how short the cable is. So I'm still trying to think of the best solution there because there's no extension cable as far as I know. The alternative would be a complete redesign of the internals. I would love to be able to get the Touch ID sensor in the top right corner, but right now the internal layout just doesn't make sense for that. Another big piece of the puzzle that was missing here was in the trackpad. So first of all, I wanna thank Digital Guy, who has been an amazing, amazing supporter through this entire YouTube process. Thank you for sticking around and commenting on nearly every video. I really appreciate it. And he gave me the recommendation that I should use a, a magic trackpad and drop it in. But unfortunately, I, I also had the same idea. And I, while I would love to be able to just basically tape or glue a magic trackpad to the bottom of this keyboard deck after taking out the existing trackpad, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the internals really line up in order to do so. Magic trackpads are, ironically, a little bit too thick, and it would often, it would likely be bumping into the keyboard itself and be too tall. And so the, uh, the alternative solution might be instead a smaller trackpad that connects to the laptop via USB and replacing this current one, which could very well be a solution, but not the most interesting one. One interesting feature of this display controller is the fact that it has a secondary input in the form of a mini HDMI, which means I can route a mini HDMI to HDMI female adapter and then put it in the side of the laptop which could mean that I could basically use this as an external display. It's a really weird feature, but it's kind of interesting because one of the biggest issues that many people have with iMacs is despite the fact that they're very, very pretty displays, they unfortunately go bad after a couple of years when the internals are not good enough to run, but you have this really expensive display that basically becomes defunct. And so it's kind of funny that I'd be able to solve that issue here even though I don't really love the display and that's probably one of the worst pieces of this entire device. Let's talk about the motherboard and the battery. When I first saw the, the internal configuration of the MacBook Air, the motherboard was positioned here and the battery is three pieces here, here, and here. And the display or the, the cable in order to power the motherboard itself is a, was a relatively short cable down to right about here on the motherboard. The issue here was I thought that the configuration had to be completely fixed and the motherboard and the battery had to be on a single level. But then I realized once I turned the battery over, I removed it first, I realized that I could basically, the, the cable was longer than it appeared. And once I did that, I was able to position the battery and the motherboard in a different configuration. It's still not the most ideal situation because the battery you can see still takes up quite a bit of internal space. And I don't know if I could fold the battery or move it into a different place. It's very, very dangerous, so I'm trying to be very careful. For the docking station, I purchased notably one of the thinnest docking stations I could find that still had a ton of ports. And frankly, I think I went a little bit overboard. This is a 13 to 1 docking station with several DisplayPort inputs, several USBs, and, and too much, frankly. And unfortunately, the result has been it's it actually gets very, very hot in normal use, even when there's not a lot of things actually being plugged into it. And so I think it consumes quite a bit of battery, even when the laptop is asleep, which has been very, very frustrating because basically the MacBook runs out of battery when it's just sitting aside. I think I might just end up getting a smaller docking station, but the big consideration is specifically something that has all of the ports that I might need in a smaller and thinner uh, form factor because right now the docking station is too large in order to case for the case to be closed in its current position. If I tweaked it around a little bit and I removed more of the internal space on the plastic, then maybe I could get the docking station in, but I don't want to commit to that if I do have a different docking station. The big 
thing that I really wanted out of this docking station was the micro SD card reader, which ironically enough is both a micro SD card and an SD card reader, which I thought was really cool, even if it's a little bit difficult to place the SD card reader. Another consideration that I had during this process was cooling. When I first tried to put the device together, I was basically trying to position the motherboard and the heatsink in a place where I could route the original heatsink from the laptop onto it and run the fan in order to have better cooling than the traditional MacBook Air. That was a cool concept, but unfortunately the internal space really didn't contribute to that or lead itself to that, and so I gave up on the idea. That's not to say that I'm completely giving up because I really, really want to have active cooling of some kind. So whether that's a fan that runs across all of the internals or something a little bit more experimental, be sure to get subscribed, I think there's a lot of optionality here. The fan, the MacBook LED, and any sort of additional RGB LEDs that I wanna layer throughout the case could hypothetically be run off of one single power source, but I need to think through what is the best internal use of space in order to get that power source. Currently, the speakers from the original MacBook are not in here, but I think I could put maybe one or both of them in, hypothetically, with the current internal layout. I just think, it's not something overly critical to me because I often wear AirPods. And so that's why I left it out with anticipation of dropping in more stuff. But I think a final product would probably need a speaker in order to make the like, bong start sound. But you know, that's a little bit less of a priority right now. At this point, most of the USB ports and display ports have not been routed. So you can see that they're actually quite empty. That's just because I didn't want to hot glue ports into place in, before I actually completed this device. It's not ideal, but I've been able to use just the existing ports on the docking station, as well as the USB ports in my little compartment in the back, and that's gotten me by just fine. Now, in the future, this was one of the big considerations for me in having this modular section in the back. I'm really excited to build some really cool custom stuff here, such as additional battery, more ports, or external storage. Now, initially I did have my uh, M.2 adapter in here in order to add uh, additional external storage, but unfortunately that was the same one that I used for editing, and so I didn't want to basically use that while I was editing the video for this product. At this point in time, I'm not using this laptop to edit videos, even though I hypothetically could because it has all the internal power of the MacBook Air. I was using my other MacBook Air instead. I love this machine, but frankly, it's not currently in a place where I could comfortably use it and not worry about breaking it, which obviously means that it's far from finished. The keyboard is the biggest concern because I want to be able to put suitable pressure on the keyboard to type comfortably, but currently I can't put it down all the way, and so I'd be putting pressure on the motherboard and the internals, hypothetically. Oh, and by the way, I was initially wanting to include the original CD drive, the optical drive from here, in order to kind of get back at Apple for removing the disk drive in like 2007 or something, but that just didn't make sense internally. While it would have been really cool, it just doesn't make sense at this point. I'm proud of where this project is so far. Even if I can't build a product that competes with Apple's, then that's okay because this still has character. It has a lot of features that Apple refuses to include in their own laptops, even in their new MacBooks. And so next week, when I get my new MacBook in, I'm going to be doing a head-to-head -head between this and the new MacBook. And we'll see if I win any battles there. Chances are I'm probably gonna lose in terms of performance, but I will secede that. Thank you for watching in a YSO. I hope that you get this opportunity to go down in the comments and let me know all of the crazy ideas you have for this laptop. Be sure to like the best ones so then I can consider them and see if I can drop them into what could be a very, very cool product. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.